Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you're tuning in from. I'm so excited to welcome you all to this global town hall panel discussion focusing on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. What a fantastic intervention from Her Excellency and the Prime Minister of Samoa. She's a powerful female leader and is representing her country on the world stage. We need more women like her. And figuring out how to empower a new generation of female leaders is one reason we're here today. My name is Deja Fox. I'm from the United States, calling in from California. Um, I am an activist. I am a strategist. I'm the founder of Gen Z Girl Gang and a Global Citizen Prize winner. Uh, I'm a content creator uh, and an Aries. Today, we're going to have a really important conversation about women, about women's rights, health, women's agency, access, and autonomy. And I want to talk about women's power, how to unleash it, spread it, and maximize it for the benefit of women around the world, and ultimately the benefit of us all. And we really are at an important inflection point in our global fight for gender equality, but you know that. In a few weeks, the United Nations General Assembly will convene in New York to review progress on the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. According to all measurements available, we are far off track, particularly when it comes to delivering on SDG 5, gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. The UN tells us that on the current course, it will take another 286 years. And I don't know about you, but I don't have that kind of time for us to remove all of the discriminatory laws and close the prevailing gaps in legal protections for women and girls. I think you'd all agree that we're moving too slow and the progress is too uneven. Not only are we failing our girls, failing each other, but we are missing out on benefiting from the amazing things that can happen when women and girls are able to contribute fully to our communities, our economies, our societies, our cultures. And I'm pleased to be working with Global Citizen this year to raise the pressure on leaders to start de delivering more results for women and girls. We agree that there's no way we will end extreme poverty without addressing the deep inequalities that face women and girls. We need transformative investments that particularly address the challenges that adolescent girls face. They are quite possibly our globe's greatest untapped resource. My work is centered around birth control access and sex education reform in my hometown. And I know what it means to get involved personally. And it's something that each and every one of us can do, looking around us, asking, how can my personal story and my personal network make a difference? And I want us to leave here today ready to do just that. So let's get this conversation started. I'm delighted to introduce to you our esteemed panel of amazing women leaders and change makers. We're here to share with us their diverse perspectives knowledge, and experience. Please welcome Her Excellency Batseksek Batmang, Foreign Minister of Mongolia, Erica Shank, General Counsel and Executive Vice President for the Corporate Compliance at Worldwide Technologies and Board Trustee of Commerce Funds, Roya Rahamani, Chair of Delphos International and former Ambassador of Afghanistan to the United States, and Sophia Carson, singer, actress, and activist. Thank you all for joining us today. First and foremost, I'm honored to give the floor to Her Excellency, Minister Batseksek. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for joining us today. I'd love to start by hearing your views regarding how we can do more at a global level to move gender equality forward. What kind of policies and regulations would you suggest to help push global commitments to gender equality, such as the SDG 5 and strategies like the UNDP Gender Equality Strategy? Furthermore, how can we promote gender equality in a way that reaches women in both urban and rural areas? Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. And uh, thank you, moderator. I extend my uh, warm greetings to the distinguished guests, fellow panelists, and all the participants from the world. It is my profound pleasure to be part of uh, this year's global town hall and speak at this panel session on empowering 
women and girls. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the foreign policy community of Indonesia and global citizens who are organizing a global scale event uh, that facilitates North, South, East, West exchange of views and reaching out uh, to audiences across the uh, world. Uh, women make up half of the world's population and possess uh, the potential to act as um, a catalyst for change and development, not only within their own families in their roles as uh, uh, mothers, spouses, sisters, or uh, daughters, but also in the communities and countries as uh, leaders, managers, executives, and skilled professionals. Uh, their full and equal engagement and their empowerment uh, are the prerequisites uh, for inclusive and sustainable uh, development. Uh, as for my country, we have a population of 3.4 million, of uh, which 50.7% uh, are women. Uh, according uh, to the annual Global Gender Gap Report issued by the EFS uh, 2022, Mongolia ranks uh, seventh place within East Asia and uh, the Pacific region. Uh, at the national level, uh, Mongolia prioritizes uh, girls' and uh, women's rights as a core principle of uh, human rights based development and integrated gender equality into national policies. Uh, we take uh, immense pride in uh, being one of the first Asian countries to legislate gender equality. Uh, women's right to vote uh, and to be elected has been enshrined in the Constitution of Mongolia since 1924. And other civil rights, including women's right to work, right, right to education, and right to political participation were enacted subsequently. In labor force participation, Mongolia excels in Asia-Pacific too. Uh, women make up 48% of the labor market, ranking 10th in economic participation and opportunity sub-index. It is also leads uh, in wage equality, as uh, well as other indicators such as professional, technical roles, and health uh, life expectancy. Mongolia aims to achieve gender equality by raising female labor force participation to 70% by 2050 as uh, set uh, out in the National Program of Gender Equality and Vision uh, 2050 policy. Uh, despite the significant improvement of uh, women's participation in socio-economic and political life, their influence and decision-making remains limited particularly in politics. To address this, we have amended the relevant legislation increasing the gender quotas for electoral candidates and decision-making positions in the public administration. The latest amendment uh, to the law of uh, election set a minimum quota of 30% for either gender candidates in the parliamentary elections and uh, starting from 2028 parliamentary elections, uh, it will be increased to 40%. 40%. The role of uh, women in Mongolia's uh, foreign policy has been steadily on the rise. Uh, until 1990, less than 10% of the foreign minister's staff were women. As the third female foreign minister, I've worked to promote women diplomats, resulting in a surge of uh, women ambassadors and directors in the Foreign Service. Today, half of our staff, 50% of our staff and managerial positions are held by women. Uh, moreover, for the first time in our history, highest number of female ambassadors have been appointed and are on duty. And distinguished participants, at the International Forum, Mongolia has been a strong supporter for international initiatives aimed in, at empowering women and the girls and gender equality agendas, in particular uh, the initiatives uh, by the member states towards uh, the protection of the rights of 
women and girls within the framework of uh, the UN and other international organizations. Uh, since 1976, the uh, UN uh, General Assembly adopted the Mongolia-sponsored resolution on improvement of the situation of women and girls in rural areas. Uh, Mongolia currently serves as a member of uh, the Commission of the Status of uh, Women and uh, the Committee on the Rights of uh, People with uh, Disabilities. Aligned with our peaceful, uh, open uh, foreign policy, Mongolia has been constructively engaging in the UN peacekeeping operations over the past years. Our policy aims to consistently increase the number of female peacekeepers. Furthermore, Mongolia put forward an initiative to host a female foreign minister's meeting in Ulaanbaatar and organize the meeting in June of this year. The initiative to host the female foreign minister's meeting is in line with our effort to raise awareness on the feminist foreign policy, the importance of mainstreaming gender equality, protecting the rights and freedoms of women and girls, uh, the empowerment and the foreign policy objectives and goals. Uh, we are proud that uh, this meeting was uh, the very first to be organized in Asia, brought together the policymakers from different regions and contributed towards enhancing the role of women in international relations, peace and security, inspiring women and girls around the world. Mongolia is committed to fulfilling its international obligations for gender equality and women's empowerment. We, uh, we regularly report on progress uh, with the recent C uh, CDAW uh, committee's positive welcoming uh, of our efforts uh, to eliminate discrimination and promote gender equality. To conclude, Promoting gender equality and empowering women and girls at all levels are critical to achieve achieving SDGs. Uh, drawing from Mongolia's experience, experiences, I propose following steps to accelerate global gender equality commitments. Uh, achieve gender balance by enhancing women's capacity for decision-making and leadership. Uh, increase women's participation in politics and uh, elections, support shared work and uh, parental, parental responsibilities, drive equality in the private sector, ensure full and equal participation of rural women in the area of uh, ICT, and uh, promote the uh, economic empowerment of women particularly an, of a rural woman uh, through in, uh, entrepreneurship trainings. Progress towards gender equality is a shared responsibility uh, across governments, civil society, private sectors, and individuals. Together, we must uh, dismantle barriers and enable uh, women's full and equal participation in all aspects of life. With this, uh, I end my remarks. I wish a fruitful discussion to the panel and every success uh, to the Global Town Hall. Thank you, moderate, dear moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Betzeksek. Uh, we understand that you now have to depart for another engagement, but we want to thank you so much for your intervention and participation today. And we're going to go ahead and keep it moving to our next panelist, Erica Shank. Erica, I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, I know Worldwide Technologies is a fantastic partner of Global Citizen, so I'm interested to hear your perspective. Uh, I also understand you have some roots in Indonesia, our host country for this discussion for our last convo. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on the role that the private sector can play in moving gender equality forward. To get specific, how we can increase, expand, and better channel investments in education and health access for women and girls in an effective and sustainable manner. Yours. Yeah, thank you, Deja. Appreciate uh, your uh, participation here. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. This is a, I'm so excited about this panel because 
I just really can't uh, impress enough how important it is that organizations like Global Citizen and FCPI have come together to bring this type of uh, dialogue to the global stage and really shed light on what it is that we need to be doing to empower women and girls. Our company, Worldwide Technology, is a proud partner of Global Citizen, and we believe that we play a vital role. To get to your to get to your question, Deja, you know the reality is we need to engage the private sector. It cannot be stressed enough how critical the private sector is to bridging the gap between you know public programs, public funding, and frankly legal frameworks. Those things only go so far. If the events of the past several years have shown anything, it has shown that just having legal frameworks in place isn't enough, right? You can have all of the right laws, you can have all of the right regulations, but if they don't get the right backing economically and socially, they flounder. So at the end of the day, we believe that we are a member of that global community that is required to make sure that the intentions of any of those public public systems really make it there. And frankly, if they're not doing the job, that we're helping advance it to the next level. So, you know, the role of the private sector, we can help, we can help advance education, we can help advance economic stability through providing jobs. We can, uh, frankly, provide better access to healthcare and other systems, right, by funding those through the programs that we offer to our employees. As a member of the tech sector, we, in particular at WWT, feel a particularly large responsibility because the tech sector grew 34% between 2010 and 2019 compared to 19% for the overall workforce, right? So at the end of the day, our sector is is adding about 14% more jobs to the economy. And that trend is projected to continue. So when we think about what can we do as an organization to help our employees and help women and girls, we can focus on, for example, making sure we're not contributing to and that we're enhancing uh, the, the deltas narrowing in the pay gap, right? That we're paying fairly. People are getting fair work, fair pay for fair work. We can address, uh, you know, sort of systematic issues around healthcare. At WWT, we're very proud of the fact we have not raised our healthcare premiums on our employees in over 19 years. We have instead absorbed that cost internally and kept premiums low. Access to healthcare means healthy, happy, productive women in the workforce. It also, frankly, means healthy, happy, and productive children of those women, which includes men. Right. So, I mean, I feel like when we're having this discussion, we have to remember this isn't a conversation uh, about advancing women to the detriment of men. This is a conversation about advancing women to the enhancement of the entire world, of everyone in our community, and that we want to have healthy, happy and, you know, successful women, girls, and we want their brothers and sisters and uncles and all of them to be good as well, because they're all going to contribute to that global economy. So, you know, I guess I would just um, I would just conclude that, you know, one of the things that we are doing in particular is investing in education. We invest in supporting schools that particularly advance women, uh, you know, women's STEM schools and other similar situations like that. We also work to give apprenticeships, make sure we're providing equal job opportunities and really meeting women where they are addressing problems in the workplace around childcare, flexible work schedules, um, you know, all of these things that can become bar true barriers to women as they're trying to advance in the private sector. So with that, I guess, you know, I would just say we're interested in investing in a brighter future. We are uh, ready to partner with anyone who is wants to raise their hand because I do think we're better together. If we in the private sector can band together and fund similar causes, we can make an even bigger impact. And we stand ready to help with this with this issue as it goes forward. Thank you, Deja. Thank you. Um, I think that sense of responsibility is so important. And I appreciate that you raised that when we invest in women, those investments don't stop there, right? That they spill over into our into our communities, our families, and so much more. So thank you, Erica. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Roya Rahmani. Roya, thank you for joining us. 
Uh, you've had an amazing career, including serving as the first female ambassador of Afghanistan to the United States. Uh, since then, you've served in many capacities in civil society, so I'm sure you have a broad perspective. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can implement a whole of society approach to achieving gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. I want to ask also, how do we bring everyone into the conversation as actors and as beneficiaries? Floor yours. Thank you, Deja. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening once again to everybody joining us from around the world. It's a um, um, distinct pleasure to be sharing this panel with the rest of the fellow distinguished panelists, and, and thanks for the FPCI for organizing this. Uh, like you said, uh, Deja, my own background. Uh, and experiences has led me um, to believe that the only way to have true, meaningful, and sustainable women empowerment is to engage the whole of society. What do I mean by that is I was born in Afghanistan in conflict. I have lived as a refugee. I have lived as a member I, first as a beneficiary and then as a member of the donor community. I have worked as a diplomat representing my uh, government and country. And uh, I am engaged in, in private sector now. So what it has taught me is it takes all of us, the whole of society, to achieve this very important and long overdue milestone which is, of course, women empowerment to lead to gender equality. But let me uh, push on this a little bit more and say that when we say the whole of society, usually it interprets as nobody uh, being left behind. But I would say it's not only the no one left behind approach, but everyone engaged approach, everyone being intentional approach, because otherwise it's not enough to simply try to um, stay with the status quo and make sure that everybody uh, is merely engaged. I want to stress, whole of society, of course, is a huge subject. It is multifaceted, multi-project, and we do not have the the time and the patience in this uh, one panel uh, to uh, tackle that fully. But I wanted to pick uh, from multitude of the issues, two of them, and, and stress further on those. Number one is about women themselves. When we talk about this whole of society, women themselves need to be engaged in this way more than they are. What do I mean by that? Is that it's not enough to advocate for equality, for parity, for rights, for access, but to demand it. It's not enough to only engage. It's important to take charge. Women need to lean in and take charge. And it's not only uh, enough to do more. They need to want more. I think this is one of some of the major issues that I keep seeing. And, and I wanted to a little bit also provoke the discussion and say that, of course, uh, as um, uh, the previous panelists spoke very uh, um, uh, comprehensively about many of the issues and the importance of getting everybody engaged. But I would stress that women themselves need to push this forward first and foremost. What, what, what brings me to this belief is the, is, the, is the depressing fact that year after year, we keep getting from uh, a variety of platforms. You mentioned the United Nations. I'm going to mention the World Economic Forum uh, annual reports that uh, continuously reports that to reach gender equality in the field of politics, you need over 130 years to, to reach it in economic, um, economic gender equality 
uh, it, it, it will take us 230 years or more. This, these are, these are pretty depressing. These are unacceptable at this era. The second point that I want to push for is, uh, like, uh, the, like what Erica was saying is the role of private sector. It is absolutely massive. We agree that in every field and every sector, there must be a joint public private partnership, but we need to do push further uh, into that, uh, whether it is uh, dealing with the climate change or the uh, financial inclusion or the, the big data issues or national security. We need to make sure that women are at the heart of this discussion, not part of it. Uh, and uh, finally, I would like to say that to get the society alert, to make them re realize and recognize what they are missing out by missing out all these potentials being left behind that women can bring to the table. And we have to also ask the, a very simple question that is it enough? Is it enough that a delegation only includes one woman, merely not to be called an men only delegation? A board is uh, regulated or asked to include 20% of women. No, we, compr we comprise more than 50% of all society and we have to have that fair share. So when, when we are talking about equality, I am going to say, let's push for dominance in order to get to equality because we have a long way to go. That's absolutely right. Thank you, Roya, for your powerful thoughts and interventions. I'm turning now, finally, to Sophia Carson. Sophia, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're dialing in from the West Coast like me, so good morning from the sun. Um, so we've heard some good points and ideas from the panel so far on where we should focus our energy to accelerate gender equality, but equally important to the message itself is how we communicate it. You're an artist, a creator, a businesswoman, uh, navigating the entertainment industry, and you've performed around the world. So I'd love to hear your experience and your thoughts on how we can promote gender equality while also navigating the diversity of thought and culture across different societies. Thank you so much, Deja, and thank you to Global Citizen and the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia for the invitation to join you today, it really is an honor to be speaking with each of you. I've been so moved by your words. Uh, my inspiring fellow panelists, Term Excellency Foreign Minister, and of course, the powerful change makers from all around the world who've joined us. It is a gift to come together to discuss our shared duty to protect what I believe, and like you said, uh, Deja, our most precious and yet most endangered species, and that is girls. As a UNICEF ambassador, I have dedicated my voice and my work as UNICEF and, and to girls, particularly to girls' education, because there can be no conversation about gender equality without equity in education, without equity in access to education. The answer lies in ensuring that no girl in any corner of the world is ever denied her rights to an education. It's a fact that we all know that there's no greater weapon in the world to defeat poverty than an educated young woman. Because statistically, when girls are educated, societies and economies thrive. But as we've all seen and um, as we've witnessed today, as our fellow panelists shared, we face a very sad reality, and that is that no country in the world has achieved gender equity. And it'll take close to 300 years for that to become uh, a reality worldwide. And the reason for that is because there's a heartbreaking 132 million girls around who are not in school. That's 132 million girls who need us, not only to fight for them, but to fight with them because these girls are, are present and educating these girls, educated young women are our future. In my travels with UNICEF around the world, I've been so privileged to meet some of these girls firsthand who I consider my heroes and I have been forever changed by what I witnessed and most importantly by the words that they shared with me and no matter the country that we were in or the language that they were speaking there's always one resounding truth and that is that educated girls will save the world so our greatest and most important battle is to fight to keep our girls in school 
So how do we do that? Right. That's the question we're all asking ourselves. And I was thinking about this earlier and I would love to share part of a journal entry that I wrote on my recent travels with UNICEF. I had the privilege of meeting with um, these incredibly brave young female students and they shared with me in their own words some of the insurmountable obstacles that they face every day in simply getting to school. They told me that most of them have to walk two hours to get to school. In their walk, they risk being assaulted physically or sexually. When they get to school, they often don't have water. When they're on their period, they told me that a lot of them have to stay home, which means that most girls in the seven to 10 days of school every month unfairly stunting their education compared to boys. And this happens because in some cultures, there is still a very deep rooted stigma around menstruation and girls are forced to isolate for their period and they are discriminated and shamed, or in too many cases, girls simply don't have access to sanitary supplies because there's a very deep, real issue of period poverty that is plaguing our girls around the world. When they're in school, oftentimes girls have to drop out because of early pregnancy, largely due to gender-based violence, and oftentimes, as they told me, a heart-wrenching result of the sexual violence that they encounter on their walk to school. Oftentimes, young girls are married off as child brides, as it is still a very real part of certain cultures. And in some cases, they told me that it simply happens because of the economic benefit of their families, families who can't afford to support their daughters. And after all of this, if a girl manages to overcome the insurmountable and graduate, once she does, there are no economic opportunities for girls. There are no jobs for them, which means that families have little to no incentive to keep girls in school. And as they were sharing all of this with me, they stood there before me fearless. And in their words and in their eyes, I saw hope. There's hope in every single girl that walks two hours to get to school. There's hope in every girl who faces the impossible and yet in spite of it all, still chooses to fight for her education, for her future and for her freedom. To keep our girls in school to get them into school and to keep them in school, we have to focus on battling each of the obstacles that girls face in accessing school, the obstacles that they share with us in their own words. They told us the issues that we need to address to protect them. And now it's up to us. It's our job to listen to them. It's our job to use our voices, to use our voices, to be their voices for they are too often silenced. And we have to be loud. We have to tell the world what we know and we have to be loud on behalf of our girls. We have to demand more from our leaders. We have to do whatever we can to push through policies focused on girls' education, focused on keeping girls in school. We have to engage men and boys in this fight because this issue isn't a women's rights issue. This is a human rights issue. This is a fight that we cannot fight alone. It's a fight that we must fight together, men and women united as one. And I think that most of all, we have to promise to never stop. We can't stop until every girl in every corner of the world is back in school, until every girl is empowered, educated, and protected. Because like I said earlier, there is hope. There is such bright, beautiful, and brave hope in girls. And and with you, Deja, I refuse to accept that it'll take 300 years for gender equality to become a reality. So today, each of us, let's make a promise to make that dream a beautiful reality in our lifetime on behalf of our girls. Thanks, Sophia. Um, yeah, I know that's right. 300 years just feels like too long. Uh, and I really resonate um, with the powerful reminder Right, as you bring the voices and the stories of those young women and girls into this space that for each of these issues we talk about, for each statistic, right, there are people at the center of this issue, girls. Um, and I want to thank you for that uh, intervention uh, and keep this conversation going with some questions and comments, bring some new voices in. So we'll now hear from representatives of civil society joining the town hall today. As discussants, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and reactions to our panelists. So we'll move to our very first. Uh, Ivy Josiah joining us from Malaysia. You have the floor. Oh. 
Thank you, um, Deja, right? Okay. Thank you for all your uh, your sharings. Um, I'm based in Malaysia and therefore in, have a very strong links to Asia Pacific women's groups. And, you know, I heard words like we make must make more demands. We um, that that we if we have policies and plans, that's not enough. You know, we have to actually translate that to actual action. Coming from the Asia Pacific region, and I dare say the global women's movement, women's 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 movements are very important for me. Almost every law, every policy, every reform has come about, not because some benign person on top said, here, have it. It has come about for the right to vote, to be free of violence, all of it has come because we demanded, Ambassador Roja, I, I, I get your, your, your phrase, demand, but women have been demanding, have been organizing ourselves and been making all those demands. So my question to all of you would be the importance of women's movements and how much should we invest in them to organize women, to make, even, to make their demands more visible, because they, we are doing it, we have not given up. Even SDG 5, the fact that we have gender in the SDG was only possible because in New York, we were sitting there demanding that gender should be part of the sustainable, de sustainable development goals, right? So the importance of women's movements, what, what do you all feel about that? The other thing is that all of our countries, you know, the other strategy, all other strategies that all of our countries have all signed on to CEDAW, that is the Convention to Eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. It's a mouthful, I know. But basically, our governments go to New York, to Geneva, and they sign on this amazing treaties and pledge. People make all those pledges that we will bring about gender equality. But one of the, but in terms of political will, in terms of delivery, right? We have many, many treaties and many, many platforms and many declarations in CEDAW, Article 5, which is a very specific article that demands that governments must make every effort to modify social patterns. Now, a lot of governments will say, we can't do anything about it. That's our culture. That's our religious practice. However, when you sign on to CEDAW, you're saying you will, you're committed to make those changes, to modify those patterns, to change those attitudes. How important is it that we also address this change of attitudes? And I mean by change of attitudes is the people who have power, specifically men who have the power. Deja, you talked about we need to unleash the power of women. I want to say we need to hold back the power of men because <laughs> and I still, it's still continuing. It's, still, it's getting out there and we need to address the elephant in the room that but really like, no, it's not about uh, what's the word that Erica used, a phrase about um, to the detriment of men. Oh, we need to, we shouldn't no longer apologize for that, really. <laughs> really, no, I feel very strongly after 40 years of doing this work, I'm 68 years old. I've seen so many ch amazing changes because of the women. So I know that that absolutely resonates. And thank you for bringing in movement and people power and culture change. Um, I'm moving now to Olinda Salguero, uh, joining us from Guatemala. You have the floor. Thank you. Hello, I'm Olinda Salguero from Guatemala, as you mentioned, in Central America, a region in which more than 52% of us are women, a region in which one in three women are condemned to suffer some type of violence, but also a region in which the women's resilience is felt in the construction of peace, democracy, development, and integration. Thank you for this opportunity. On, be on behalf of the Global Peace Foundation and the Skipulas Foundation, I'd like to, to uh, highlight some points. In 2023, we celebrate 75 years of the Declaration of Human Rights and 60 years of the Declaration of the Rights of Women. And also, we are into the post-COVID recovery. I believe that gives us a tremendous opportunity for a transformative recovery with gender equality and environmental sustainability. <clears throat> One of the main challenges we still have to empower girls and women is to close the gaps. There were mentioned some 
a specific amount of years. And for example, in Guatemala, if we don't move faster, we will have to wait more than 200 years. That is 10 generations for girls and women to fully exercise their rights. And that's crazy and we cannot allow it. In addition to what has been evidenced by our distinguished panelists, I want to pay special attention, focusing more on Latin America, because I, I think we need to strengthen efforts in the political participation of women. It is still too low and we need more women taking decisions. Building better conditions allows to deal with the political violence against women because that is um, uh, avoiding women to participate in politics. And I also want to leave on the table the issue of the care economy. That is the open work that is related to maintaining the home, care with the other people in the home or the community. Let's think that even in the market, one of every two women is in their formal economy. The economic global value of the paid work done by women represents, listen to this, represents $10 billion annually, three times more than the amount of the technology industry. In Latin America, 75% of that work is done by women. Can you imagine if we achieve an economic model in which the care economy is paid? How will that change women's life? How will that improve our society? As long as that doesn't change, as long as we don't achieve that unpaying work can be balanced between the role played by the women and the role played by men, that we have public policies to cover many of the roles that women are playing on paid right now, this reality, which is one of the enormous inequality and enormous injustice, is not going to change. The world is changing, so we must change our mindset too. Women are peacemakers. Investing in women is transforming humanity because we are of one family under God. And this is our world too. And that is not without women. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Chineye Oyemezuvu, uh, joining us from Nigeria. Thank you, Deja. Thank you. Thank you for an amazing panel, amazing panelists. I'm going to pick out a couple of things that our panelists talked about and make reference to my part of the world. Her Excellency mentioned her deliberate attempt at em an empowering women, employing women in foreign affairs. And so there have an increased number of women as ambassadors. I want to pick on that because I think that one of the challenges we face as women is we work in silos. We do not work as a collective. The strength in our numbers, and I think that has been downplayed over the year. So we find that I have quite a situation where there's a disparity between the women who've gone ahead of us and the younger women. I think that we need to understand that the strength in our numbers. The, our male, the men understand this. We tease them about the boys' club. They understand that the strength in their numbers. I think that we need to get on that bandwagon as women as well. We cannot keep working in silos. If we keep doing that, that Deja says we have 300 years. We're going to have more than 300 years. We do not have that time. We need to understand the need for us to work together as a group, collective strength, the strength in our collectivity. We have to speak with one voice. It's very, very important, you know. I also noticed, for example, in my country, there's been an increased participation of women in politics, appointments, women in judiciary, and the private sector. We have women, C suite women, women are being appointed on boards as board members. Beautiful, laudable achievements. But my 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 concern my concern is this: I do not see the synergy between the older generation and the younger generation. We're missing that. I think it's very important. It's something we need to address on this panel. <laughs> I think it's something we need to address on this panel and see how can we foster this unity amongst ourselves as women. I also want to pick on something that um, Sophia said about the men. It's important that we know that they're not our enemies. They are our allies. We cannot do this alone. We have to work with them. We have to work with them. They're not our enemies. They're our allies. I think that's the point. Thank you. That definitely resonates. And um, next we'll hear from Nindia Satavan joining us from Indonesia. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Deja. And thank you, panelists. Such great um, interventions earlier. I guess my questions would take a little bit of everything that my fellow discussions have pointed out before. Uh, I guess it's down to how do you actually navigate cultural nuances while adapting strategies that um, foster a diverse, inclusive, and progressive policy so that 
in the long run, we can ensure that women uh, who are take, women can actually not just taking up the space, but actually earn it. Because we all know, I think it's great that uh, women's political participations um, in some countries, they're given like 30% uh, representative. But then we also know that the counter argument would be the 30% quota is just given and they're not actually earning the space. So I guess uh, uh, that's 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 my question. Uh, really, thank you very much, Deja and fellow panelists. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from Risha Safkad joining us from Pakistan. You go for. Thank you. We can't hear huh? yeah, Arisha. Yeah, I think we may be having some technical difficulties hearing you, Arisha. Um, while we figure that out, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn to our moderated discussion um, and bring in some of those questions, put them to our panelists. Uh, and if maybe we can include yours in the chat um, or try once more. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are going to turn now to the representatives of civil society uh, with a big thank you for your interesting questions and comments and get the reactions from our panelists. Um, while we do that, we'll collect further questions in the chat online. So do feel free to engage there. Uh, this is your chance to weigh in. And Arisha, we will collect your question there as well. Um, I move now to my panelists. Uh, and I want this to be a free flowing conversation. Please move between yourself. But I know Roya, you had addressed that you might like to take that first question uh, posed to us about movement, people power and culture shift. So let's maybe start there. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, um, I cannot agree more that uh, the power of movements are monumentally important. It's I've been a force that has made huge changes and we are thankful today uh, to much of that work that has brought us to where we are where it's it's not enough it's far from being complete but it is a lot and a lot has happened over the past decades because of these movements so that's totally given i just wanted to clarify what i am saying demand versus advocate is what i am saying is to demand, you need to be part of it. You need to do the descent from within. You have to be at that table. You have to be at that club. You have to be at that network. You have to be at that field. You cannot, advocacy is absolutely immense and it has taken us very far and it has to happen. It's not exclusive. It's not either or. It has to happen both together, but to to make it to the board, to make it to the layers of the uh, politics or the, the, the place or the table that, that you need to make the decision, you have to be there and you have to uh, extend, uh, extend and expand that number. You have to make sure that you say, look, I am the only woman as I have, to, uh, if, if I uh, admit here, that has been the something that I continuously stand along for more than a decade now. Look, I am the only one. You see, I am the only one. So that matters, and we have to we have to make sure that we bring more along, pass the torch, but at the same time push for that demand and descent from within. That was that that's what I wanted to add to this. And and uh, I uh, s s since I have uh, uh, I have to run shortly. I would like to also touch upon the other uh, point that one of the uh, uh, one of the discussions um, raised, and that is the the quota system. Yes, the quota system, the regulation is helpful. It has made a lot of shifts and changes. But again, to own it, we have to. Uh, we we have to demand it. We have to act on it. We have to take charge. And and 
we have to aim for just 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 go with the mindset if that's a given you absolutely have to fill the entire quota but what extra mile you can go so that i i see your point and it makes a lot of sense how do we do that i think we have a great panel here and there would be a lot of different strategies to discuss i don't want to take up more of time thank you ryan uh is there anyone else that wants to intervene or weigh in on something from the discussants we had conversations around people power culture shift political violence the care economy intergenerational perspectives uh and more uh is there any of our panelists that would like to intervene there i wanted to just um mention that there was something that Chimenyi said that really resonated with me. My mom has always said this, but I think hearing it from her and in the current state of the world that we're living in really resonated. She said that women are peacemakers and investing in women is investing in peace. So not only is the conversation about investing in women to further society and to further economies, but in the state of the world that we are living in, where we are witnessing such chaos and destruction, both political and physical in wars, keeping in mind that investing in girls, investing in their education also means investing in peace is, is something so powerful. And I appreciate you, Chimenyi, for, for bringing that up today. I do as well as a recent graduate and a 23-year-old in this space. I think that intergenerational perspective is so important. Um, Erica, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think this intervention on the $10 billion value of the care economy um, really, to me, you know, had this direct comparison to tech. And I wonder if you want to yeah. weigh in there. Sure. You know, I, I mean, it's, clearly that is an issue that, uh, you know, that, I mean, you know, the, the dollars that are out there, that's, that's huge. And the amount of effort and time that it takes in order for women to provide that care and then you know they're taken out of for example educational opportunities or taken out of the economy uh, otherwise is is something we definitely have to address you know as far as tech goes i do think that as the as tech continues to advance the way in which we live work play right at tech is everywhere anymore i think we have the potential <clears throat> to empower, you know, women who otherwise might not have access to getting to, for example, a location, right, to be able to work from their homes, to be able to, um, you know, pool resources and find different ways in order to get into that, into that workforce. We've got a long way to go, right? We definitely have a long way to go. But, you know, I think we're finding ways using technology, we're finding ways to reach corners of the world that were previously unreachable. And we're doing it, you know, collectively. Uh, just a one small example: we invested a school in Orissa, India, that didn't have uh, they didn't have power, right? So we built solar panels. So now they have power, and now they have access to be able to do online classes and things like that that they would not have had access to previously. So I think we can I think we can advance uh, with with technology and the private and public sector working together. Uh, and to just come to uh, a, an audience question addressed to you, Erica, sticking with you, um, we have a, an intervention here uh, asking, this topic holds great personal interest for them, Olivia R. from the Philippines. Uh, you know, this is relevant to her coursework in international political economy and institution. And with that in mind, uh, she asks if you could offer a more comprehensive explanation of how companies can utilize the unique strengths and viewpoints of women to bolster their attractiveness as long-term investment prospects. And if we can keep this answer tight so we can try to come to Arisha, who it seems has joined us again. Thank you. You, you bet. So listen, at the end of the day, uh, you know, by becoming an, becoming an employer of choice means being an employer that embraces all people that embraces diversity of thought, diversity of leadership, and really brings that that people can bring their whole selves to work. So I honestly think what it really boils down to is companies being aware of that power that they hold in order to allow people to be themselves at work and really embracing wanting to have a well-rounded and a diverse workforce. 
And if we do that, I think we can make great strides. And, and like I said, in the interest of keeping it brief, I'll, I'll stop there and we'll turn it over to you, Asia. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Arisha, uh, I know you're calling in from Pakistan and you are final discussant, so I want to give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm so honored to be a part of this respected panel today. And I, and, um, I will just quickly try to write, wrap it up. Um, as I'm from Pakistan, I want to uh, give some statistics and uh, bring some um, uh, things to the table today. Um, as belonging to a uh, developing economy, uh, education of women in Pakistan is a uh, big of an issue. Um, you can say that about UN report, report in recent years in 2021, about 22.8 million, uh, million children are still out of school, out of which only 8.6 million are girls who are enrolled in schools. So, um, I would like to say that it is a long road for us to uh, go and um, as uh, being um, a, per a person who is belonging from a developing economy, I know that it is an everyday struggle to uh, be a woman and uh, uh, be involved into a um, uh, public sector to make your place. So, um, but there are also the really good examples in Pakistan. For example, if I can tell about Haber Pakhtunkhwa. It is one of the uh, provinces of Pakistan which has the lower, lowest uh, literacy rate. But in recent times, there has been a woman university developed, which is just um, specified for women across uh, the areas of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, not just Peshawar, the city, but all of the surrounding areas. And there has been about 16,000 women studying currently at that woman uh, university. So it's one of those examples. Then we have a um, woman university in Islamabad as well. That is another big university who is uh, supporting uh, all the women from different parts of uh, Pakistan. So um, yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are uh, green areas. Yes, there are a lot of hurdles um, to be part of a uh, job sector, to be part of education sector. But the progress is being made slowly but gradually. And I do uh, agree with every one of the panelists today that we need to uh, start making decisions. We need to start making changes ourselves as well and with uh, men that are in power. We cannot do this alone. We we cannot do this uh, just by sitting and talking. We need to sit with people in power and have a meaningful discussion just like this and try to make them understand from where we're coming from and what is our perspective and what are our hurdles so um it's time to take um a, it's time to take actions rather than just uh, discussions and discussing about the challenges and i do believe that uh, in pakistan in particular uh, there is a lot of rural and urban ga gap so um uh, that needs to be uh, uh, shortened because uh, a lot of um, uh, population resides in the uh, ur rural part of the pakistan so if we do that, then uh, surely we will get somewhere. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we appreciate your adaptability uh, and your voice in this space, Arisha. Um, we are coming close to close. Sophia, there's just one final question from you from Risky in Indonesia about how we create um, perceptions and attitude change through mm -hmm. empowering portrayals of women in media and what you believe this impact can have on young girls' self-esteem, aspirations, and overall empowerment? That is such a beautiful question. Thank you for your question. It is um, one of my greatest honors to be able to do what I do, not only as an activist, but also as a storyteller. And um, precisely your question is one of the reasons for why I love being able to be a storyteller and bring female stories to screen. And I made a promise to myself many years ago that I would never tell a story or portray women in any negative light, whether it is through cinema, through TV, or through music, because I believe that it truly is our responsibility as women and as artists to represent women in their most glorious, beautiful, and authentic light, because there are millions of men women, boys, girls, however you identify around the world, who when they watch this film or when they listen to that piece of music, they are 
perhaps inspired in some way or feel identified in some way. And the more that we share stories of, and as much as I hate the word or the phrase powerful women, because to be a woman is to be synonymous with strength and power. But unfortunately, the more that we share stories of empowered women, I think the more that we start to see a change in systemically in our culture and in our world around us. Um, and um, it really is our duty and something that I am very happy and proud to be a part of. And I so appreciate uh, your very meaningful question. Thank you. Thank you for handling, uh, taking us into that space. And I know, Erica, we already got to address an audience question for you. So I want to thank all of you for um, your questions, your answers, uh, and your perspectives here. Um, I think we have time just for closing remarks. If anyone has any final things that they want to share um, as we close out, uh, now would be that moment. I just want to say, just remember that we are, I agree, we're, Sophia, being a woman is equivalent with strength and power. Let's not forget it. Thank you, Erica. That's I just want to say thank you so much. It was truly an honor to be a part of this panel. I'm so inspired by each of you and by your commitment to girls. And um, I'm just very grateful and very honored to be here. And um, hopefully I'll be seeing some of you either virtually or in person at the Global Citizen Festival in New York, September 23rd. It will be a really special evening where we'll come together through the power of music to celebrate, you know, truly changing our world. So just thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, I'll see you there. Um, <laughs> great. And I can see many of you. Uh, we've now come to the end of our panel, and I'm so grateful to the amazing women who joined us for this discussion today. Uh, as well as those of you watching and engaging uh, online. Uh, I know that this panel really spoke to me, um, and particularly the words of our discussants coming from all over the world. Um, I was inspired by the ideas of pair and the way we must value it. Um, I was inspired by the stories of girls this morning and putting them and their experiences at the center of, of people power and women's movements and their importance in pushing us all forward, um, and maybe most by an intergenerational perspective, that we are going to do this and do it together. Uh, and I, for one, pledge to continue fighting for gender equality and a gender equal world every day. Um, and I hope you all can be inspired to do the same. Uh, I wanna encourage you all to become a global citizen like me and Sophia and take action uh, to continue this important conversation wherever you can, whether that be at your dinner table, on your favorite social media platform, um, or or through storytelling. Uh, your story is yours and yours alone, and it matters, and we need it today. Uh, and this town hall isn't over yet, so please stay tuned for more powerful stories and perspectives. And thank you once again, and have a fantastic day, wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.